Welcome. We're here for the 41st episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. Today's session is being recorded to share online later. And in fact, this afternoon, you'll receive an email with a copy of the recording and any resources that are mentioned in today's broadcast. Just a quick tutorial in case uh, you're joining us for the first time. We love to use the chat during our program, so please feel free to chime in, uh, change the setting to everyone so that uh, we can all partake in the conversation. However, since the chat goes by very quickly, please use the Q and A section for your questions. In there, you can also give anybody else's questions a little thumbs up and that upvotes them so that they come, those questions come to the top. And let's see, we do have as part of our diversity, equity and inclusion program, our live machine captions turned on. You can toggle them on or off and you can also change the size. I can only see so much, I can, no, I can't see it. I can only control so much of what you see. So please take a moment to make sure that you've adjusted your screen so that you have um, optimal viewing. You can, I do have side-by-side -side mode in effect today. So you can move the separator to change the relative size of the speaker versus the slides. Um, and as we go along, you can also zoom in and out to look at the photos more closely. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. Now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ottawa, Ojibwa, and Badawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm the contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabe land, ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library also acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and the established hierarchies of settler colonialism. We are so grateful for everyone who uh, supports this bookworm program, either through your attendance and participation and perhaps through your donations as well. And today's episode is generously sponsored by an avid bookworm supporter. Thank you so much. All right. Click very quickly if you haven't taken our poll because I'm going to end it and share the results. All right. So as we were signing in today, we were discussing a little bit about labeling photos and um, asked all of you to let us know if you label your photos. And this can be your personal collection or a collection of photos that um, you've been amassing. And I see that 21% have said yes. So kudos to you. You need to give us some tips about how to make this happen in the chat because it's a hard thing to do. 25% um, of you said no and 
props to you as well, because you've made a decision and stuck with it. And then most of us, 55% say sometimes, because it does seem like a good idea to avoid those family conflicts. Like when I was growing up and my family would show slides from um, my uh, parent, my mom's siblings' childhood. <laughs> and the, there, there was always a big discussion about which brother was in which photo. And then people would be trying to figure out what year it was and whether it was Bill or Dale. And so, you know, all of that could have been avoided by a little labeling. All right. So thank you for participating in that. Whoops, whoa. Back. There we go. It is my pleasure now to introduce Cindy Matzenbecker. Cindy's interest in photography began as a child and in high school, she was affectionately called the mother of the dark room. Yeah. She went on to receive her associate's degree as an electrical engineering technician and began working in research and development encompassing lead acid batteries and solar panels and lots of recycling. Cindy has served in all the various positions on the Michigan Photographic Historical Society and is serving her second term on the Daguerrean Society Board. She has been collecting photographs since the mid-1980s with a special interest in occupationals. Welcome to the program. Wow, scary. That intimidated even me. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and, and it's great to spread the news about historical photography. So, and, you know, it took me a while to figure out what a daguerreotype was, but I did figure it out, so. Yeah, well, speaking of that, maybe you can start us off talking a little bit about the types of formats that you'll be sharing with us today, because I think I, sometimes it's a little confusing to sort out those early yeah, because I was buying hard images like this, and I didn't know the difference for a while, but it, I had to figure it out, because once you start talking to people, they go, oh, you're a doofus. So the daguerreotypes was the first process, so you can get the idea of how hard it is to see them, but when, when you, in real life, you would look at them close against your clothes, and you go to the Daguerrean Society symposiums, and everybody's wearing black. And it's not because they're all in mourning. It's so that your clothes don't reflect. You can see the image. So it's silver plated. It's silver plated copper. And then they fume it with um, bromine, I think it is. And then they fume it and then they expose it. And then they put it over boiling mercury. So that's why you never touch the surface because you will smear it. It's, it's sort of resilient, but it's not real resilient. So then, um, let's see, I got a quote Graham Romer saying that this was the perfect photograph and it went downhill from there. So then they came up with uh, ambrotypes, which is, see, you could see right through it. That's, uh, it this process had to be done all wet and you had to do it, finish it up. If it dried, then you were done. So then, but it, it's a faint image and then you have to put a piece of like black cloth or paper behind it. And sometimes the glass is red, which I don't know if I have one here. So that was, these are all the commercial processes. There's all sorts of little side processes that went on, but these are the ones that could make money. And then um, they, it, this is from France or Daguerre came up with this process and Samuel Morse brought it to the US in 1839. And it took off in this country because everybody needed to have something to make money on and they figured it out. And the ambrotype process is a lot less, um, let's see, specific in how perfect you have to do it. So then they, they so that, that helped when they switched over because it was easier to get supplies and it wasn't as much work. And then they came up with the tintype, which is the same process and it's on metal, it's not really tin. They use that because they were calling it a cheap process, so they called it tin. 
and then they realized they could make negatives with the amber type kind of a thing and because these are all one-offs they're only one of a kind and then when you came to uh figuring out that you could use it as a negative then they came up with heart the disease which you could that you could make duplicates and then they figured out you could you know if you had an actress then they could sell lots of them and then they made more money with that too and then the next process was cabinet cards and they went into those little albums that went on your cabinet. So, um, and then when they, when Kodak came out with those cameras, you would take like a hundred pictures and send it in and they'd send them back. Then pretty soon it, it was turned into like the snapshot era. And then now it, and then it just about evolved into board mounts and folders and then everything else that you see when you were a kid. So how's that? Did I confuse everybody? I, I think it was a good quick snapshot just so that uh, everyone knows um, a little bit about the evolution and also that we're going to see some different types along the way. So I'm sure that you'll, you'll give us um, some tips about how to look at these different types as we look at the slides. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's see what we have to start. Well, okay, this is a daguerre. These are daguerreotypes, just like I showed you. And I like little old ladies because most people pass them over. They do, you know, they're looking for the pretty girls or the cute babies and stuff. But, you know, I like little old ladies. They have a lot to say, whether they people believe it or not. Some have more to say than others. But I like the lady on the right because she looks like she could make a decent cookie, you know. She's fun. She's almost smiling. She may not have many teeth, but that's okay, too. So when you're looking for these daguerreotypes, um, how often do you actually, you know, when you're buying them, do they actually know who's in them? Uh, very seldom. Sometimes if you take them out of the case, their names are in the back. I'll we'll see if this comes out. Oh, no, because we're on show. But <laughs> this one doesn't have anything in it. But sometimes there's a name, sometimes there's a poem, sometimes there's hair, curl, a curl of hair or a little bit of braid um, or a note. Sometimes there's notes, but not very often. Sometimes there's, if you're lucky, there's life and death dates. That book I was telling you about that Sean Nolan did with all the identifying, he will only use them as evidence if they have the day and the date and it says this photo is taken on. It's very specific, so. Okay, and so um, let's see what's next. Oh, some more. Yeah, now these ladies look a little grumpy. I mean, I don't think the lady on the right there would make too many cookies that were good. But the lady on the left, look at her work-worn hands. I mean, she's, she's done some work in her life. And they, they all have the head coverings because they didn't have heat like we have. And, and if you're a camper, you know that if you're cold, you put some on your head and that keeps you warm. So the dead lady on the right's gone. But here's a young woman and she's pretty fierce looking. She's got a, a book in her hand, I think, and she's got hand colored flowers and they, they put gold on the jewelry. That was also a woman's job pretty much to do the hand coloring. They would put powder on the plate and breathe on it and that would am amalgamate it right to the surface. Oh wow. Um, did it have to be done right away or was it a process? I would later? think it would probably be right away because then they would because these are of course I don't have but if I can get this out of here. They have seals on the back of these and you you literally oh the good it came off. So here's the back of it. Can you see the seals, the paper seals around the edges? So that would keep the moisture out and keep it from tarnishing. So you'd have to do it right away. So the cases are one part, um, I mean, you know, practical, but also, as we see here, very beautiful. And then, oh, yeah. as you it. mentioned, could also contain some other little tidbits behind the photo. Oh yeah, no secrets in the back sometimes. 
And then they made these thermoplastic cases. They were, they, some people call them gutta percha, but they're not. They're, it's thermoplastic and it's a conglomeration of uh, resin and uh, sawdust. And then they put them in the molds and then it gets hard and they can be clean, but they're, sometimes they get chipped, but there's an example. And so they had mother of pearl cases, um, tortoise shell cover cases. So it depends on how much money you wanted to spend. Right. And so did, did people keep these closed or would you leave them open and displayed? You could do either, but like in the Civil War, a lot of them were small, like there's, this is a real tiny one, but there are smaller ones too. And you could carry it in your pocket. And some of them are oval. So you could take, and you know, it's an intimate experience. You open it up and you could see, you know, the picture of your girlfriend in there, you know, or your children or your family. So, Right. Oh, that's amazing. And here's two, two more ladies. Can you imagine wearing clothes like the one on the right? Just tie it into your clothes. Very fancy. She's got those. And then lace gloves and then on the left is that some more gold highlighting yeah. her jewelry right and sometimes they would pinprick the surface of the daguerreotype with and that would cause it to the silver to move around and it would cause more of a reflection oh wow and there's the inside of the case same woman I should have showed the outside, but that but that when you ho hold it like this, it would keep it from reflecting. Because it's sometimes the pads are green, mostly they're red though. Now there's a stern woman. There's something that was inside. It might have cost her a dollar. So and I think a dollar back then is like forty, forty-five dollars now. So this wasn't for like just frivolously done. And, you know, and there's that writing. You can't really read it. I think it says reading Pennsylvania. But, and I don't know about the date. It's got to be 46, 56, maybe 56, because it's pretty elaborate. The mats would be much earlier on. They were, were a lot less busy. They were pretty flat. They were more like this one, more round and not so ornate. And where, where did the uh, cases and mats come from? Was that something that the photographers provided? Oh, it was quite the business. So like now, like the guys that make them now, they usually just make their own cases. But this was, you know, all the stuff was there. It was like you could go to the store and order it or it was more common to have that stuff around back then because it was such a big business in the United States and Canada and Mexico and South America. Right. That is one stern woman. There, there's some fancy women right there. And that the one on the right has hand colored flowers in the booklet and gold jewelry. She almost looks like she's sewn into her clothes, the one on the left. Yeah, the, yeah, the one on the left is probably a little older because of the mat. And that's an amber type. It's, it's just, doesn't pop as much as the other ones, but that's that's a nice pose. There's a little brown case too, a brown mat on the inside. Right. So the amber types were still in the cases, but um, just a little bit different process. And so did that start to make photographs a little more accessible or yes, not they became a little cheaper, but not a whole lot, not until they came to the um, where you could use a negative tin types were cheap. So that's why there's okay. plenty of them. Oh, and this is to show you that, you know, they always talk about the little boys. They always call them little boys or little girls in the images. And they, they all wore the same clothes because it's why bother? Because, but they see the, the girl in the middle has got her hair parted in the middle. And the boy's hair is parted on the side. So that's just so I, you could see that. 
it's kind of so when you see cabinet cards, they kind of stopped doing that towards the 1900s. And then when you see some adults that the men have their hair parted in the middle, but that's what they did with little kids. So that sister, the oldest sister is very protective. <laughs> There's uh, two women and their clothes were made. Everybody made your own clothes. You didn't have clothes like you had today. You probably had one in the closet, one in the wash and one on your body. So. That's why wedding dresses, you, you didn't have a white dress unless you had a lot of money because why spend all that money and not wear it? So, but these, I don't know if they're sisters or friends, but they have the same cloth in their clothes. Yeah, the, the photographs, you know, are very personal and tell little stories. It's just that we don't always know exactly what those stories are, right? Yeah, you, after you see enough of them, you sort of get an idea, but you, you never mm -hmm. know. It's just another mystery. Because now I look at them closer, they're not sisters. And there you go. That There's some mom and babies, mom and children. A lot of work. So A lot of work. <laughs> You mentioned that the one on the right has ruby glass. Um, yeah, I didn't have one out here. I should have, but but that's how this. Where, where is it? And that's where the base of this would have been red glass, and you wouldn't have needed this back piece so much. But the glass can be all different colors: blue, orange, purple. So that sort of gives them a little more value, but maybe not so much, unless it's marketing. <laughs> but can you imagine no diapers? And then I found this one at a flea market and it was first thing in the morning. And I was like, not, not enough coffee in myself, but it's in a thermal plastic frame and the, that the backdrop with the hand colored trees with the flowers in it, it was like, oh, I, I, I'm going to blow my money right here first thing in the morning. But I couldn't walk away from it because it would have been one of those regrets. So and apparently after I've heard about that, uh, that's some specific photographer someplace in New England. So sooner or later, I'll find out who that is. So um this one looks a little brighter than the last couple of examples. Is that true or is it just the... That's pro it's true because they had better chemistry. Whenever I've taken an amber type class, I always test the chemistry first. So in this, he must have got the chemistry down pat. He knew what he was doing. Or she could have been a woman too. Got it. Okay. So that's part of part of the key to being a, a good ambro type photographer. Yes, yeah, so you have to know your chemistry. And here's uh, the tin types, and these are occupationals. They're weavers. This is the shuttles. Uh, big fun. So, what first got you interested in occupationals? And maybe for for the audience, you could just say a little something about what, what we mean by occupationals. Um, I guess I first started collecting postmortems because they took pictures of pe dead people because that might've been the only photo they ever took. But, you know, they got to be so much the same and they, they were pretty expensive. So when I was out looking, because I was working and because I needed to support myself, I thought I'd start looking at occupational. Plus when I was working, I would, get these technical pictures and I take them to the skilled trade guys at work and they would explain things to me. And it was like, there was so much more going on in those, all the engineering principles and things like that. So I thought I, I needed to do that. Plus being a woman working in a man's job, that was always, it was always, it, it was a challenge, but you know, it kind of opened some doors for me. So Nice. Yeah, so it's it is exciting to to see the kinds of jobs people people had and and the pride in in that work. So let's see. And and if people did have fun, so I thought this, these were cute. 
Because, you know, they always talk about how nobody smiled. Well, you know, getting a picture taken was pretty formal. So at the time, but then but when tintypes came around, they were easy to do. They set up at fairs and they would just go take pictures of anybody. And I don't know what's going on in the left one, but she looks like she's ready to get up and go dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the one on the right makes me think of a photo booth, you know, a kind of silly pose. That oh, the backdrop. Might. Yeah. But then, you know, but even the way they're posing, you know. Yeah, you can tell who the ringleader is there. <laughs> so, you sure can. Yeah, I love to collect the goofy backdrops too. Goofy backdrops, just like whatever they accepted back then. The, just the fake rocks, the fake trees. It's like folk art, some of it. Mm hmm. And this one I picked up because I, I noticed the backdrop first. And then I noticed she had odd clothes on. And then when I was scanning it, I didn't even realize that was a mask there. So I don't know what was going on, but I thought that was pretty interesting. So they definitely then just like they do now. Maybe she's at a masquerade. Yeah, or, or it could be like Mardi Gras. I don't know. And so I see she's got a little pink in her cheeks, too. So they were still doing some hand coloring with the tin types as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did that all along. And then pink was considered too strong for girls. So that used to be a boy's color in the 1900s or 1800s. No. It was too strong. And here you go. Uh, there's the fake prop on the left with the desk with the fake books in it. But there's a photo album on the on the like the ledge, and then there's the big the one in the middle is the hidden mother. That one's pretty obvious, but a lot of times you see all the babies they're like pinched in there. They have a blanket over the mother's head, and she's like squishing the baby's head to keep it in place. It's it's pretty funny. Or you could see the parents hiding down behind the chair, and their arms or legs are sticking out. It's really cute. And then I found this one with them uh, playing cards. I think it's a tarot spread, but I'm not sure. So cards, no, they didn't have TVs back then. They had to do something. And I originally bought the one on the left because I thought she might be a hat maker. But then I started thinking she got to the studio and took it off so they could see her face. Mm, good point. And it, since we're on hats, I found this other one for me to find Black tintypes, African American, it's it's really tough, even here in Detroit. But you know, I you every once in a while you get lucky. But they've got a lot of elaborate stuff, but and they also have books on the table, which means they probably could read, which is not something that was so prevalent back then. And the, the one on the left is uh, an occupational. They're making, I think, ribbons or hats. I'm sorry it's a little fuzzy, but that's the way it came. So, and then this, the one on the right is probably a woman photographer. That's probably not her, but she stamped it on there. So, God, you got to let you know that women did this too. A lot of times they were in the business with their husband. And, and if the husband passed or took off or whatever, then they still could make a living. Because I, I went to um, Robert Shimon does tintypes. I don't know if he still does. But he said that uh, you really need three people. You need somebody to do the paperwork, somebody to help you set up, and you need the photographer to, to really run a business. So that was kind of interesting. Right. So, so there's probably a lot more women behind the scenes than we even know about. Right. And then some of the big places they would have parlors, you would go sit and look and you would look for the frames or you would look for the cases. And so and they would help you calm down. So I just watched a video about women photographers and she said, yeah, some people looked at it as worse than going to the dentist to get your picture taken. <laughs> oh, OK. I like. My wow. Picture. Yeah. <laughs> And there's a bunch of women on the left with their purses. It's very nicely posed with the, the odd backdrop. It's just, 
fabulous image. And then to find uh, photos with uh, veils over the faces is very uncommon. So I, even as beat up as it was, I thought I had to have it. So kind of we get in your way, but. And then here's some occupationals. There's uh, the maid on the left with her broom and she's cleaning the candle or the, oh, my brain's dead. It, uh, glass for the lamps. And then on the right, another woman's job was uh, to set up the printing. So she's, see, she's got the apron and then the, it must looks like a brother behind her is holding the newspaper. So that was a woman's job to set up because they could spell, I guess, better than the boys. Do you think those are kerosene lamps? Uh, probably whale oil, something that smelled nasty. I found a lot of these years ago because now you, everybody's looking for photos. Okay. The one on the left is like crocheting or knitting. And the woman on the right, they just put all those um, photos in there as part of the props for the stand for the photo. And there's a tea party on the left. And I think that's um, some kind of ethnic woman on the right. I have no idea where, but as she had a nice pose, it's just beautiful. So um, on the, the left, that again is another dark one. Do these change with time or is again, this have to do with the, the it's chemistry? It's probably the original. One of my friends, her husband would go to Europe for the summer and he put a full plate tintype in the back of his car, and covered half of it and left it over the six months he was gone and it wasn't changed. Now, if it was hand colored, it'd be a different story. Okay. I just happened to see one of the chats came up about something being reversed. These are all reversed until you get to the it's these one of a kind are all reversed from what you see because of the lens. Now you could have a different, you could put a prism in there that would make it positive, but you probably had to pay extra for that. I had, I went and took a class and I made a daguerreotype. I took it home and showed it to my mother. And she said, who is that? She <laughs> didn't realize it was me because it was reversed. But a lot of the letters are reversed. I don't remember if that, if the newspaper was reversed or not. It was, I think, the, yeah. Can you tell? Maybe if somebody zooms in. Yeah, it looks like it might be. Yeah, and that's, you know, all those Billy the Kid tintypes, you know, his hair was parted on one side, but they, the tintypes there, if you reverse it, that blows that out of the water, so. Right. And uh, the, the one on the left, there's a, she's holding a stereo viewer. You would get slides, glass slides, and you know, you know like your view masters, but that you would look in there and there's a little cover that would open up and it would let the light in through the glass. That's English. And then I have parrots and cats. So I, when I saw this one with this African gray, I had to have it. It wasn't cheap, but it was a beauty. And dead dog yeah. even needed did the parrot. Because you know, you see those pictures of the babies with their heads wiggling all the time. So everybody so now um we've moved on to these cabinets oh, to the CVDs. Yeah. And so, um when did they start taking those? Do you remember? Probably they started towards the beginning of the Civil War like just prior and then they took off there because everybody wanted pictures of their family when they went off to war. So these are the first ones you can do duplicates of because they had a negative. And they always say negative, sometimes on the back they'll say negative save forever. But you know not they didn't. Life's what's happening when you're making other plans. Right. Um, yeah, so 
So uh, in terms of the time that you had to sit for these, was it, sh does it keep getting shorter as we keep changing? Um, yeah, when I methods? took that, when I took the daguerreotype class, it was late in the day and it was dark out and it was a North Light studio and it was a 13 second exposure. But you did, they talk about all this long-term stuff. And that's not true. I mean, you didn't have to sit there for 20 minutes or any of that. Maybe the first couple of photos, you know, they were overnight exposures, but not so much. Uh, and they, they the, once they added, I think, I forget, they added something to the daguerreotypes that made it much faster. And, you know, these you just go in, sit down, and you just click and you're done. Nice. So, so it's a little easier to take a picture of a, of a parrot and a dog. Right, right. And there's some more part of the seats of women. With the stuff on their heads. And then I was lucky enough to find these. And, and then those are the, the reverse side of these, the, with the photos. Yeah, the backs, you know, with the photographer's marks. Some of them are real elaborate and fancy and some of them are, are just blank. So it's a crapshoot again. Nice photo of two girls on the left. And I thought everybody needed to know people did wear glasses back then. And there's some goofy backdrops and props. <laughs> it's like, let's put a boat in a studio, a cardboard boat or something. You yeah, know, that one's I was so busy looking at the background. I didn't even look at the women. Oh, and then um, women didn't wear pants. You were obligated to wear a long dress. And then there was the bloomer movement. And that, so they would, they would start shortening up the pants and you could see the pantaloons underneath. I'm not that good at clothes, but I got so excited when I saw these that I could buy them that I did. And she's got that odd hat too. You would turn around and look at her if she was walking on the street. And there's some more. I need to do research on these ladies. I love the person, the woman on the left. This is all upstate New York. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, when there's a little more information about the photographer and some of these other things, sometimes you can track down more information. And, and you could see the headstand on the woman on the right. You see there's a, like a little thing behind. Let's see. That's her right foot. But that would hold her head in place so you wouldn't move and blur. So even the adults, they did that to, to right. be like, to, okay, seriously, hold still. Just, yeah, they, if you blinked your eye, it wasn't so bad. But, but if you moved your head, it would be fuzzy and then you'd be mad and then the guy would have to take the picture over again. You didn't want to waste your resources. There's some more of those. Do you have a lot of bloomer? Uh, no, I, in fact, I was bidding on these on a Facebook auction and I ran them up to like over $60 a piece. And, I, and all these people, they didn't know what they were looking at. And I'm, they're asking these questions and it's like, I'm not saying anything till this auction's over. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, and then the guy came back and said, I have one more of these. I'll sell it to you for such and such a price. Because even he was surprised how much money he got for it. So, and he was an ephemera dealer. So. Nice. Big fun. Oh, and this is a professional invalid. She was in bed 62 years. She was pretty fun to look that up on uh, Wikipedia. There was all sorts of stories about her, too. But to be lay in bed for 62 years with tuberculosis. I think she did eventually die from a tuberculosis too. So um, in this case, uh, 
is she making money from these photographs or yes, is the photographer? Yeah, they would sell and she would lecture. I don't know if she'd lecture from bed or what, but she did. There was a lot of money to be made for like circus photos or, and then during the civil war, they had those, they were not, they were photos, but they were photos of drawing like of Lincoln and his family and all that. They would sell that to make money. And, and like this one isn't a copy, but a lot of times copies, a photographer would take a picture of the picture and sell it himself. And the copies are a lot lighter. Okay. Um, I know that in some of the photograph albums at the Clements, we see photos like this intermixed with family photos. Yeah, the, well, they, in, they would sell album fillers too, like the angels or Bible verses or artwork, they would all just stick them in there. Cause you would buy, you know, like my aunt, she would pick up pictures out of the garbage but she, and she mixed them in with the family stuff, but you would, you would just, you know, if you, you would collect the pictures of your friends and your family and they wouldn't necessarily, if you get an album, it wouldn't necessarily all be your family. You'd have to, you can't assume that. But they, if there was an empty page, you put a uh, album filler and they made cabinet cards and CDVs of album filler. Oh, and th these are, um, the Goodrich brothers were African-American. They came out of Pennsylvania and they settled in Saginaw. And there's a museum in York, Pennsylvania where the, um, the father of the brothers that came here at his studio and they did daguerreotypes all the way up, I guess, to, to CDVs. And I just talked to the curator there and then she does, um, I think there's even some cabinet cards and they were pretty famous in Michigan. And then the wing, he came up with a multiplying camera and he, um, he spent his life trying to protect his patent, but he was all over the United States. So, and he had a big gallery in uh, Grand Rapids, Simon Wing. Nice, yeah, it's, it's definitely getting to be a especially good time to be a photographer as these um, methods became available. Oh yeah, and then the, if, I, we should mention Dave Tinder's directory here too, the 8,000 plus Michigan photographers. It's free online at the Clements. Indeed. And here's one where they, um, they use the back as their business card. So you could always go there and it, it's almost like a business card today. I guess it is like a business card. And this cabinet card, I noticed it because it had all the little electricity around the hands and the head, even the hand that's hanging down. And then I, it's like, it just disturbed me. And then when it came, I started looking at it and I wondered if it was a guy in drag dressed up as a woman, but look at the arms, but it, another mystery we'll never know. But the electric, Electricity around the head and the hands was just hysterical. Yeah, so that's drawn in in some way. Yeah, that was drawn in in the negative. If it's if it's white, that means the light was blocked out. So they drew that on the negative, the glass negative. So yeah, seeing seeing some some artistic, uh, you know, uh, ideas oh, yeah. in a card like Let's see this. See what Clayton says. Could be. Oh, a, yeah, Clayton's saying a spiritual guide or healer, perhaps. That's that's a, a good idea. And the, the, it, probably the first thing that grabbed me was the goofy backdrop, so. Just another mystery. And there's some cabinet cards. I, I just thought the one on the left was a nice family, you know, grandparents with the grandson with the backdrop. And that's a nice cabinet card on the right with the backdrop with two friends. Yeah, lots of elaborate backdrops for sure. Yeah, the boats, it's just, you know, you don't even see the people halfway. And there's the snake lady. I think there were three snakes in there. 
So that was her occupation, taking care of the snakes at the circus. And then their palm reading on the right. Yeah, so they're they're both probably selling those those cabinet cards to people. Right, right. Probably for a small fee. And there's a graduation photo on the left. It's kind of fun. And another goofy backdrop on the right. Look at the dress. Jeez. How many layers do you need? <laughs> And that I thought was kind of odd, having posing a little girl with a sailboat with the backdrop of the ocean. And then it's from New York. So maybe that's Lake Erie <laughs> or not like Lake Ontario. And there are some hairstyles. People didn't take showers like they did today, too. And there's another, it might be a, a graduation picture on the left. And the one on the right was intriguing to me because of the posing and the, the person in the background, just, they look so much, the head is so much bigger. It just didn't look right to me, but who knows? Another mystery. And here's some people playing games. Checkers, checkers. I like the posing on the right. It's too bad it's a little faded. Yeah, you can definitely see that some of the um, photographers are better at posing people than others. Oh, yeah. And then if they didn't wash their fixer out, those circus photos done by Went, W-E-N-D-T, they never washed the fixer out because they were so busy making them fast that they just didn't rinse them. So they're all faded and a little bit yellow. Okay. And this was a new one that just came in. I thought it was kind of fun. The maids at a tea party. And it, what's the difference with a board mount? Okay, the board mounts were bigger and they, they really weren't, I don't know. Sometimes they put them in frames, but I very seldom do I see them in frames at the flea markets. So, but they, they're bigger. No, it's too bad I don't have any hand. Yeah, I do. Here. Here's a big one. Ah, yes. So now we've got, got some bigger sizes. Yeah. So this these are coming up. So these are just came in the mail too. And this just I just got this, they're reading tea leaves. Ah. And then you can see the date kind of in there in the bottom. January. Oh, January 1st, maybe, 1891. And this just came. And I think, I think they're doing mushrooms. I really couldn't tell, but those are, are those baskets of mushrooms? But that would explain the sticks because they could dig them out of the woods, out of the ground like truffles. I'm not sure, but I thought that was a good occupational. You can't really even tell where it's from because somebody must have rubbed out the name. Yeah, that, that definitely looks like one that could be fun to, to research a little bit more. Yeah, it's like, I wish I could blow it up myself. I should, <laughs> should. And these were just cute little kids. And bicycles, when women got bicycles, they got much more freedom because they could scoot on by all those people harassing them. And there's an occupational, usually you see people with uh, weaving or spinning like that, it's usually European, but this one was from Ohio. Oh, nice. And, and real photo postcards came out. They're really popular because people could take pictures of, and send them to their relatives. And so the one on the left is kind of new, but it was really neat because of all the marionette puppets. And then the ladies on the right, you know, they're, they got the washing stuff in the bag, the chickens on the ground, they're wearing their aprons, they're holding fish and flowers. You could see the big dinner bell up there. 
So, and then they had the house on the back and then they probably did the cooking in there on the right side. Because I know people didn't like cooking smells so much back in the day. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more going on in these photos. Um, you could look for a long sure. time, see lots mm -hmm. of things. And I like to buy multi-generational photos too. So there's four on the left and there could be five on the right, but hard to say. And that's uh, actress on the left, smoke cigarettes and man's uh, women in pants. And there's women in pants on the right. And I think the woman in front is handicapped. I uh, special needs, I don't know what the right term but I like the with a very plain backdrop, but something that yeah, it's looks probably like just it. hung right up. And, mm -hmm. and of course, there was always the naughty photos. I didn't have the real naughty ones, but you know, the one on the right has the numbers, so there was a series of those. And she's got the schlocky backdrop with the fake booze bottles, and the one on the left is a French postcard. So and they would sell lots of these. Photos are money to people. And here's some occupationals. That's the old phone system there. I love the, the Christmas cactus on the left. And then the one on the right is a series also, but it, that's a French postcard. But I have a friend that collects typewriters, so that's a, a shout out to him. <laughs> oh, the coloring on that one is just beautiful. Oh, yeah. Really is. And these I just got in the mail, or I just picked them up at the uh, uh, photo show in DC. But uh, that's women in pants on the left with their bicycle. Took me a minute, I thought, those aren't men. So, and then on the right, just it's just like, there's a lot of work going on there, cooking, cleaning, washing, and discipline. So you can see who's in charge there. And this is uh, in, in, uh, in like a drugstore. So women did smart things too. Yeah, and it's not easy to take those interior photos. Right, you could see the light flash from the sunshine. It's kind of like me sitting here with the light on me. Right. Really not this pale. And you, okay, guess who's making the sauerkraut for sale here? It wasn't him. <laughs> he may have the apron on, but she looks like she's in charge. And there's some women in pants. Okay, and these this these I just got off of an auction. And they oh oh this one is this is a watch factory. Just looks so grim. Um, can you imagine the sound with the see the um belts going all the time? It just would have been really loud. Yeah, these wow. ones I just got, they, they're straightening tobacco leaves to wrap tobacco, to wrap cigars in. So look at all those um, belts and stuff, just loud and dirty and dusty. There's another picture. The next one is a little further out of the same thing. I love the American flag all tied up out of the way. <coughs> And the next one is the men versus it. I just didn't really want to add it, but just to show you the conditions that the women had it in a much cleaner area. You can't really tell, but there's like barrels next to these guys where they they must have been chewing tobacco and spitting it in there. It just looks really awful. And that, yeah, and I was a waitress. It drove me into college. So, and I just love this. You could see the greasy walls and the, the moose head over it. It's like, wow, this is just great. There's a fox in the corner. <laughs> that is great. And then I just got that one too. That was like car hop stuff. And there's a hat shop. I'm sorry it was so bad, but it showed the hat so well that I left it in. Oh, it's amazing. Okay. 
And there's, I think this is a, a classroom, but these women are learning about chemistry too. And there's a big stove there on the left. Is in glass. And there's a um, fabric store. Store interiors. And there's, you could see the pipe sticking out of the wall there up in the top. So they would take the stove out in the summertime and put it back in the wintertime. Wow. And that was just fun because they had balloons and dolls. Yeah, they're definitely having a lot of fun in that that mm -hmm. pose. And there you are there. Everybody's outside playing croquet. And I like big house pictures because of the architecture too. So they got porches all over in their big windows. Probably had a maid too. So it's like a big water tower up behind the house. And I First Nations photos are hard to come by. And this one I found hand colored. And it says to the, the one I love only, your wife. Oh, that's nice. There we go then. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> many amazing photos. And I'm sure oh, yeah. this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, because when you, you asked me to do this, it's like, I was so overwhelming and I thought, I, the only choice I have is I just got to go through the new stuff and that's the new stuff. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay. I, I was trying to sort of pay attention as we went along, but I'm sure there are lots of questions. I see 22 in the Q and a, okay. um, but first I am going to do just a couple of announcements because the next announcement is super exciting. That mm. Zooniverse project that you and I have been talking about, Cindy, has launched. So cool. um, yeah, we're and we picked out some uh, women in our real photo postcards to show off. And so we invite all of you to take a look at the link and read about our um, crowdsourcing project. We're calling it uh, Picturing Michigan's Past. There are 60,000 postcards from the David V. Tinder collection of Michigan photography that we are asking for help identifying what and who and where in the postcards. So we hope that you'll take a look. It's going to be a really fun project. And then once, um, once we have more information on all of the postcards, then that will all be compiled and the postcards will, will all be available digitally. So read more about that and get involved, you know, um, help us identify what's in all of these postcards from around Michigan. I'm also excited to announce that we are dipping our toes back into some in-person programming. And so you can join us on Monday uh, at 4 p.m. in Robertson Auditorium at the Business School to hear Honoré Jeffers speak. Um, she is talking um, about an issue of mercy, exploring the life and writing of Phyllis Wheatley Peters through documents and poetry. Um, Professor Jeffers will discuss the research and practice that led to her award-winning book of poetry, The Age of Phyllis. This collection is based upon 15 years of research on the life and times of Phyllis Wheatley Peters, a formerly enslaved person who was the first African-American woman to publish a book. Professor Jeffers will discuss the connections between archival research and creative practice and the ways that early Americanist scholarship can benefit from engagement with contemporary poetry. So we hope that many of you will be able to attend in person, 
In addition, we will also be offering a live stream of this event. So register if you would like to watch it from home. I know that we have people from all over attending this program and we'd love to have you join us. Next bookworm is Friday, April 15th at 10 a.m. and we'll be having an author co mm. conversation with Gregory Dowd, uh, a professor here at the University of Michigan about his book. Um, so join us next time for that. Since you've already registered, you will receive a reminder and you can cho choose to join us live which we love, or you will receive an email with the information that was provided during that broadcast, as well as a link to the recording. As always, we would love to have you join our um, community of supporters, the Clement Library Associates, to help us continue all of the work that we do. In addition, we're looking for uh, sponsors for future episodes of The Bookworm. So let us know if you're interested in that. Okay, let's see what kinds of questions we have. All right. Um, Okay, so Lisa was asking, and I think we covered this along the way about whether or not wealthy people were the only ones who were having photographs taken. Um, but it seems like as we move forward in time, it's more accessible and less expensive, right? Right, right. The garotypes were like, it was such new technology, only the rich people could afford it. And then as time went on, it's just, and then it looked to the clutter of snapshots we have today. Right, exactly. Oh, Tom has a, a good question. He's wondering at what point in time did people start smiling in images? Was there a difference between young people and old people in smiling? Well, a lot, there's lots of talk about that, but it was, you know, originally it was a solemn thing, like going to the dentist you, to get your picture taken. And, you know, you're taking a picture for posterity, but then people also, you know, they didn't brush their teeth like we do. And, and also smiling was forward. You know, the first time I went to Europe, I was so happy and I'm smiling at everybody and they're all like, what is wrong with this woman? It's like, so then I learned to stifle as they said on the family, whatever that show was. So, but it just was such a serious thing and, and you didn't smile. So, but later on, and they did, obviously in those tintypes that people were smiling. Right. Yeah, so a combination of, a combination of a change in societal norms and in the Yeah, technology. body language and you just don't want to be that available because you smile, you're available. Right. Um, let's see. Tom is also wondering if the frames and cases were reused with different photos. Uh, pretty much they used them up as they went along. So that's a big contention with, you know, somebody wants, they don't like the case a photo it is in in a show and they ask to have it changed that the dealer will say no, because it's an artifact that sticks together you know, don't change it, you know, leave it alone. Don't fix it if it ain't broke. And okay. you know, it's just like any antique, don't do anything to it that you can't undo. And what kind of, um, you know, what's the proportion of hand coloring in uh, photos, those early um, photos, what do you think? Maybe 10, 15%, but you know, but. You know, I don't even see the red cheeks anymore because there's so many of them. So it could be more than that. I don't know. That's a good project. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And if anybody else knows, chime in in the chat. Um, Clayton, if you're on and have any ideas, um, let us know. Uh, 
Let's see. Was it common for young boys to have long hair and be dressed as girls? Well, they really weren't dressed as girls. Everybody was dressed the same way. Well, that's just how we perceive it. They would be dressed as children in back in the day. But because they had flowing clothing, they thought they were girls. But it was easier to change diapers that way. So uh, what was the first part of that? Uh, oh, oh, hair. But hair. You, oh, yeah. yeah, and you were talking about the parts and how, how yeah, that. Yeah, the parts. The boys were on the side and the girls were in the middle. And so one of my girlfriends, she didn't want to cut her kid's hair until he was like six. He had gorgeous hair. So now I've been collecting pictures of boys with long hair. But their hair was always parted on the side. So, and they, it was kind of like you get, you, you got breached and you didn't have to wear those, you got to wear long pants. It was kind of like getting your hair cut too. It was like a stage in life where you were older now, you didn't have to have it. Right. Um, so, yeah. And Clayton's mentioning that hand coloring was an extra charge. Oh, yeah. That was extra. And Rob is wondering if you would share some stories about your favorite finds, best deals, et cetera. Oh, well, I'm kind of a bottom feeder because I can't run with those New York big dogs, you know, but, you know, you can still find a truffle here and there. Um, I found a pack of 300 French postcards for like $350. I couldn't turn it down. You know, it's... Um, and then I have a, a big, I could go get it, but that you don't need to see my back. But I bought a daguerreotype. It was at the end of our photo show and I ran the show and I was too busy running around. And one of the dealers, he didn't want to pack this thing up. It was like this big and it was marble and it had a daguerreotype in the middle. So I had to buy that because I'd never seen one before. Oh, and I have another thing. No, oh, where is it? Uh, I don't know if I could show it. You could see my piggy room. Um, you could just peek it up. You could just barely see it right there. I went to an estate sale and it was, there was this picture on a vase and it was really ugly. And I, but I'd never seen one before. So I picked it up and I took it over to the dealer and at the dealers and said, how much is this? They said $75. And I thought, this thing is ugly. So I put it down and I walk around the house and then I thought, I've never seen this before. I got to buy it. So then when I got it in the car, cause it's, it's probably this big, it's, it's in a paper towel holder and it, I, it rattled when I put it in the seatbelt. So it wouldn't roll around. <laughs> I start looking, I start thinking about it because, and then the inside only went down like a third into the bottle. So I realized I might have somebody's ashes. So I went back through the grapevine and I found the family name and looked it up. And they, and the people also, I found out through the grapevine that they knew it was ashes. It's like, they just wanted it gone. So I did find out through the great, uh, through ancestry, through the family name, uh, what his name was. I, and he died young. I, it's probably a farming accident. So, so I got his name tucked in the bottle. So the, hopefully the Clements wants this. Maybe that's not good, but <laughs> go with their postmortem collection. So that that's the best story. Yeah, that's that one is pretty. Um, yeah, I was like, what am I going to do with this? So now I have a quiet roommate. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I lost the the I saw it somewhere. Someone was asking about. Um, oh, here it is. So Barbara Prince was wondering where is is an online auction for photographs? So maybe you can talk a little bit about you know the sources you know these places that have where you're finding these online auctions and then maybe even the photo show that um oh I yeah there, i just came from the dc photo show um ephemera fairs have them there's a big ephemera event this weekend um any postcard show has photos uh, book shows have photos 
Uh, there's always the, any, uh, like Heritage has auctions and Collins, which is now Hinman's has auctions. And then there's the Facebook auctions, but that is a time hole. There, there's so much, there's a lot of good stuff there, but there's a lot of junk. Things that you wouldn't even put in the bottom of your birdcage, but you know, somebody's buying it. So at least all I think of is people are learning about it as well. So, mm -hmm. so where is this show that you're talking about this weekend? Uh, it's in Connecticut. It's the Ephemera Society. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. And they're in any good paper fair, you know, just do a Google search. You can find it. Then do, it's a rabbit hole, though. You might never come out. You could have a house full of crap like me. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. It's good stuff. It is good stuff. Um, so Tom is sort of thinking about, because we talked about the chemistry, we talked about the art a little bit, and just wondering, do you think that photographers were primarily technologists or artists? Oh, it's a good balance. You really had to know what you're doing, but you still have to know, you know, it's just like mixing paint. You know, we had an artist down the street when I was a kid. I had no idea you did all that stuff to the, the where you paint on beforehand. You got to get that all ready too. So you, it's kind of a balance. Like some of those photos were so well posed. Those are the artists. And the ones where the people are just standing there stiff, maybe they were the technologists. It's the yin and yang of it. Right, right. And as you mentioned, if you have more than one person working together, then maybe you get a nice balance too. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the person was crabby and they're not going to listen to you that day, you know? So. <laughs> the kids, Good little, point. Little kids don't hold still. Yes, it's true. Um, so I think we have a few questions about the different shutter speeds and we covered it. We started to talk about it, but maybe if you could just go over those different types one more time and sort of talk about how long. Okay, because the gear types basically, they just took the, because it was not as sensitive, they would just take the cover of the lens off and put it back on. They would count 1001, 1002. And then as time went on, then they would get the shutter speeds. And some of the old cameras, they had really specific, really short shutters. So, so you could, then once that evolved, then they would work from there. Does that make sense? Um, so even with these processes, it still varied a little bit, but as you were mentioning, it's not as long as people think. But it's right. long right. enough that if you move a little bit, you get blurry. But right, right. But that, we even see that now. Type. Yeah, yeah. Even with if you don't have enough light on your phone camera, you're going to get a blur, or it won't take a picture at all. Right, right. And yeah, and we do have um, to a uh, Discover ser series. Uh, that Clayton did that talks a little bit more about the history of photography too. That's recorded. If anybody's mm. oh. interested in some of those details, always learn more someplace. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Maybe a couple of more. Um, oh, the backdrops. You mentioned the backdrops several times, and Tom is wondering, you know, where. Where did they come from? And some are really elaborate and artistic. So how, you know, what do we know about? Uh, the it was probably in catalogs too. And I was lucky enough to see somebody's backdrops. And I don't want to tell his name because he, he doesn't need to be bombarded. But we saw some of those backdrops. And I, I was shocked because they were in color. You know, and all the pictures were black and white. And then he's unrolling these things. And it was like, wow, look at this. I felt like I was, it was a religious experience to see all these. So, but there, they had them in catalogs. A lot of people made them. You could see those folk arty things where, where you're like, what were they thinking? But, you know, nobody was trained. They just drew a tree in the background. It's kind of like that one Ambro type that, that was just, it was not real, but you got the idea it was a tree. But that was, that one had to be handy. That, that goes back to the artist versus the technologist again. Right, right. So, 
so there were catalogs with the backdrops, which means that around the country, some of the photographers had the same backdrops then. Right, right. If you had enough money to buy it and had, you know, and then the travel wagons or train cars, they had train cars, they would have the backdrops just there. Some of them were on wheels. You could see the little things. And some of those old photos, you could see the lighting in the ceiling where they had the skylight. And if it was too bright, like it's too bright on me, they would have a cloth over it and you could see that hanging down. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of different elaborate setups. Um, yeah, and some of it, you know, those guys just ran around the country with a wagon or, you know, like, what is it, Sullivan that had it, had all those glass negatives on his donkey and it fell over the cliff. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> He's in the mountains. Yeah, that, that'll put you in the nut house, right? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Work. Um, I don't know what maybe this will make sense to you, but Aaron's asking, was Guta Percha ever used for early photo cases? No, that's, that people didn't know what to call this. It's thermoplastic, it's a composite, but Guta Percha is like, I think it's like bog wood that's carved and there, there wouldn't be enough of it to do these things. So, but these, these were resin and, uh, and just sawdust put in a mold. Sometimes some of them were better than other and some of them weren't. They made all sorts of stuff, combs, jewelry out of this too. Oh, okay. Yeah, so gotta purchase really like waterlogged wood carved. And that's, it's relatively rare. You don't, you really see it, but that's just a misnomer that was put on it early on and people don't get that that's not gotta purchase. Thank you. Um, Rob is mentioning that the backdrops were sold by the same companies that painted scenic backdrops for theatrical productions. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love, though, that you're pointing out the, how colorful they were, which makes sense because you'd want to see them in color in person. Um, because that's one of the things that I'm always struck by having looked at old photographs, you, you don't realize how colorful the clothing is as well. Right, and um, most tintypes, daguerreotypes and ambrotypes are blue light sensitive process. So it's, you, the reds turn different colors and you, it's, you can't assume anything about the colors because you see multiple things, but it, you know, like we have parrots and they see different colors and they react different. It's, and you really got to pay attention. So just because you could see it, it's just like bees and flowers. They see different light reflecting off of it. So I don't know if that confused everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good things to talk about. Um, so Cheryl uh, is asking about uh, suggestions for an archive to send prints to um, and talking about a friend who has did extensive genealogy and they're labeled going back to the 19th century. So uh, Cheryl, um, you know, the, the Clemens Library certainly collects photographs primarily in, whoops, in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, Clayton certainly could have a conversation to talk more about that. Um, you know, as, as you've seen from these photographs and from, um, as you'll see, if you look at the Zooniverse platform, you know, photographs have a lot of information in them and, and we're really interested in continuing that research and preserving that history. So um, certainly, you know, send me an email and I'll connect you with Clayton and we can talk more about um, whether it makes sense at the Clements or someplace else. Yeah, or you know, there's a Bentley library or even in, mm -hmm. I mean, whatever state you're in, there's got to be a library or a museum that would like it, hopefully. Right, exactly. Uh, photography is done. You're not going to be finding this stuff. Anymore. It's like, it's like my, I'm a hoarder, but it's an opportunity. Like when I was a kid, I saw this bake light jewelry for sale. And then I started, ah, I'm not going to buy it because I can buy it later. Well, you can't. It's gone. So yeah. 
exactly you know, take your photos out and if you get you know and half the time there's the print is so bad you don't want to keep it anyway <laughs> yeah and glenn and joe just talked about what you you were saying that um if they're from one particular area historical societies are also interested so makes, oh yeah makes good sense yes yes don't throw it out don't throw it yes out. exactly don't throw out people um forget because it's something at your house or in your family and you know maybe it's all piled up in a box but um you know ask before you throw it out because they're they're you know everyday people are really what makes up history as mm -hmm. well so it's important to to keep that information boy have we run over time for you I, well, you know, people always have such interesting questions that um, we've been going until 1130 a lot of, a lot of times. So, um, we'll answer a few more and then uh, if we don't get to all of them, uh, um, we'll look back through them and, and see what else we can, can do. Um, so let's see, there is, um, people asking a little bit more about how you do the research to find things out about the, the photograph. And, um, you know, do you look at the clothing? Does that help you date it? Is there um, having the photographer, does that help figure things out? I don't know if you have any examples of ones where you've done some more research and, and how, how you might have tracked Information oh, Mr. Down. Google is a wonderful thing. And then if, if you run around with a bunch of photo people, they, you can listen to them talk and they can tell you where they find things. There's newspaper archives. It, it's, it's just a question of sitting down and reading through all the details to find what you're looking for. It's, it's a rabbit hole. And then you can look up and it's two hours later and you only found out three things, but you're happy. So. Right. Exactly. Just, if you start researching, you'll figure it out as you go. Figure it out as you go. But you also have to be able to read what's in a picture. And it's the old engineering thing. If you're doing a project, you can't want it to turn out a certain way. You have to be objective and look to see what's there, not what you want to see. So. Yeah, that's that's great. It's. Um, I think that that's, that's one of the keys. And hopefully you'll all sign on and take a look at Zooniverse because it'll give you just, you know, some little hints. It'll help about. you look. It'll help you learn to look. Mm -hmm. That's half the key is walking by and seeing something. I think one of the first daguerreotypes I bought, you know, it was beat up. It was $15, but the guy had an earring. So then I went to work and asked the guy in the Navy, what's the story? So then they came up with, he'd been around the horn. He'd been around uh, across the equator, or a lot of times they would wear, you had a gold earring, and if you drowned, then they had money to bury you, and you could keep the leftovers, you know, so, but who knows if they buried her or just ran off with the earring, so. <laughs> it's a crapshoot. <laughs> right, right, exactly, so. Well, this has been an amazing way to spend the morning. Well, thank so you, thank you. I love to share and you go to the relatives and then you could see you start talking about your photos and you could see the film drop over their eyes. <laughs> so at least we had a good audience here. <laughs> yes, this is lovely. It, it was really wonderful. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and for your good. Yeah, and if you want me to do it again, questions. I will. <laughs> okay, good. Because okay. I'm, I'm sure you have lots of photos that we could take a look at. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's, yeah. Super. Um, yeah, Doug Johnson says, no film on our eyes. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. good, thanks. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Cindy, and thanks okay. everybody for joining us and right. have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.